Hi, it's me again, Johanna, um, community archaeologist with Big Ventures. And last week we talked about pottery, what we can learn from it, how we clean it, why it's important for us as archaeologists. And I thought today let's have a look at a different finds group and why not take Anubra? So, as you probably know, animals are very important for us humans. They always have been very important, be it as a source of food for company or to help us with physical work. So, with time, we came to appreciate more and more the different qualities and skills of different animals. And today we even have guide dogs, we have therapy horses or dolphins, and we kind of yeah, use animals, our whole relationship with animals has changed over time and kind of also stayed the same. So Again, as I am locked in at home without a garden or a nice box of finds to clean, um, I thought let's call another one of our community archaeologists. Today I would be calling Indy. She has also been working at Earth Trust and she has a lot of boxes of animal bone that she's taken home from site to clean so that they get ready for the sending off to the specialist. So um, I would say let's get some nature into this call. Um, and I'm going to call her and see how she can help us with cleaning and identifying and what else we can learn about manifold. So, yeah. Hi, Indy. Hello, Johanna. Thank you for welcoming us into your garden. Um, I thought we could talk today about how we process animal bones, what a specialist can learn from our assemblage and where modern science may be able to help us come to a conclusion about our site. Yes, that sounds good. So maybe I'll talk a bit about what I've got in my garden that might help this conversation a little bit. So I was at Whittenham Clumps um, before lockdown. Um, and when we had to leave site, um, I took home boxes full of animal bone to clean um, and process at home. So I've got all of that behind me now. Um, so Earth Trust is a Roman and Iron Age site. Um, it's right next to an Iron Age hill fort. And it's got later Roman occupation. We think um, it's very agricultural. It's clearly a very um, sprawling, dense Iron Age settlement, which continues on to become a um, Roman farmstead or the buzzword villa um, is what we think we've got. So we've got a couple of kind of agricultural buildings. We've got corn dryers, so they're clearly they've got crops. But the other thing we've got that we can see they're doing is lots of animal bones through their like refuse. Um, so in the Iron Age, they've got these storage pits they're using to store their food. Um, but once they go out of use as a storage pits, they use this backfill like uh, rubbish landfill sites. And in amongst all of that, they're chucking in all of their food waste. And included in that, obviously, are animal bones because they are a waste product of eating animals. Um, and so we've got an example of various animals that have ended up in those kind of contexts and also in the Roman uh, deposits as well to kind of talk about today. That sounds extremely interesting, <laughs> uh, and I can't wait to get a to get a proper look close up to the bones. But um, spending that much time around bone must have really got you into thinking about the relationship between animals and humans. And I think, especially with the bones from Earth Trust, as you say, that um, reached back three thousand years ago, um, about human interaction with animals. Yeah, and especially because when we're looking at examples from the Earth Trust that these are all, um, the majority of them at least, are domesticated animals. So these aren't uh, tame animals. It's not like a Tiger King type situation where we've got wild animals in captivity. These are domesticated um, kind of farmyard animals. We've got examples of um, horse. Um, so we've got horses, so, that, you know, um, obviously domesticated and they're used for things like traction. We've got examples of um, potential like uh, sheep or goat. Um, maybe used for wool, maybe being used for meat, maybe being used for, um... <laughs> I nearly said something very silly then. I was going to say milk, but I was going to get onto that one with cattle, uh, <laughs> which we've also got examples for, which um, that could be used for milk, um, leather working, um, meat again, um, and again, like horses, they can be used for traction. So we've got 
a wide variety of animals being represented at the Earth Trust, and these are all part of their agricultural um, society. So it's important to say that we're talking about domestication. And like I said, with the corn dryers, this is obviously plants as well as animals. So um, domesticated animals and plants um, come from, you start seeing them around the Neolithic Revolution, but we've even got domesticated dogs um, as far back as 15,000 years before present. Okay, that's quite a long time. So you say that what you have at Earth Trust looks like um, domesticated animals, so no wild animals, wild bones coming in. At the bulk of our yeah. assemblage. But as we'll go into later, you often find other bits and bobs that can tell you a bit more about how people are interacting with animals, both as we've had bulk here domestic in terms of maybe they're rearing animals, but they've also got maybe animals they don't want. We've got a couple of very small bones, potentially from rodents. So that's the that idea of vermin, probably unwanted. Um, but you've also got, um, we've got examples um, of bird bones. So maybe of um, wild game that they're um, hunting. Um, or maybe and we've got examples of chickens. So you've got, um, other than just the domesticated animals, there are wild animals in there, maybe for food, maybe pests. Um. Well, that, that does bring us to the next part, because in order to figure out all these things, in order to be able to say we have sheep bones, horse bones, which animals we have and what they were used to, we have to cook them. So um, I would say, let's have a go at it. Are you ready? Yes. Good. So we basically need the same equipment that we also needed for the pottery. We need, uh, exactly. So we need a bone. We need a toothpick or a skewer. We need a toothbrush. We need a bowl with water. And then we also need, oh, that's a big bowl. <laughs> <laughs> bowl with water, your bowl can also be a bit smaller. Uh, <laughs> And we do need also a fine stray or something where we can then put the clean, clean bone into and preferably some masking tape and a sharpie to write down the context number. So after cleaning, we still know where in the trench the material came from. And then again, like we did with the pottery, we always give the object a dry clean first. So yeah, that's the, the finished tray. Um, and then we start with the toothpick or the skewer and the bone and just give it a dry clean. And the reason for that is, as you can see, Indy is picking off a lot of like really big lumps of dry soil. And if we would start now with water, she would just create mud around it that's just caked around the bone. It would be really tricky to get that mud out of um, openings, out of little crevices in the bone. So it's always good to just start with a dry clean. Um, and the only thing that you have to be quite careful about is that if you use a toothpick or a skewer and you have a pointy end is that if you're not sure if what you're scratching away is actually soil or bone, you maybe use the long end of the toothpick um, or yeah, so just like this. So you're not actually using the pointy end to maybe even scratch the bone and create some fake um, butchery marks or something. So only really use the pointy end when you're sure that what you're flicking away is soil. So you can see that Indy is actually, there is a lot of soil on it. And even what might look like at first glance, like a very compact bit of bone, might later turn out to have a hole come through. Um, Which we can start to see it see if I can get a bit more of it. Yeah, so this is really difficult to see once the soil is wet, which is why we always start with a dry bit, because once this is just like a layout mud and uh, you might then actually mistake that for bone, especially when it's dried again. It is as well, if you think that um, we get lots of our bone as this kind of yellowy colour, which isn't necessarily the colour of bone, it's the colour that the soil has stained it which means in a lot of cases, on a lot of sites, the bone and the soil will be um, very similar colours. So I would say we'll fast forward a bit. So yeah. once um, we are certain that we've removed most of 
the soil as much as we can with the toothpick um, or the skewer, we can then start with water. And when we start working with water, we have to remember that bone is a living tissue and it's made of, two la of several layers. Um, two main layers that are interesting for us, the outer bone, which is very compact bone, and then on the inside, you have the spongy bone. It looks a bit like honeycomb and it's where, um, where the bone marrow was in. And that is very, very fragile. So we can see here a couple of small holes. And if, first of all, if you use the toothpick and just start scratching, you can actually scratch that spongy bone away which we don't want. And also if you use, if you take the bone and just dunk it into the water, it will immediately absorb all of the water. It will get very soggy, it will get more fragile. You can actually just break off little bits. And obviously we don't want that. So um, when we then start with water, we have to be quite careful. Ooh, the weather's helping me right now with that step. <laughs> <laughs> it's just started raining. <laughs> Right, I'm very nearly through, very, very nearly through on this last little bit. Well then, while you're cleaning, tell us what is actually your favourite bit of bone to clean? Oh, I picked my favourite bits of bone, it's a vertebra because I find it very um, satisfying when you manage to get the whole way through and they've got all these, um, particularly the, sac the, the sacrum's the best, that sounds really odd, but because you'll see that on a vertebra they've got this uh, one down the middle, but then they've also got a couple on the sides. Um, and because the sacrum is almost like a couple of fused vertebra, it's almost how it's um, structured. You've got like all of these coming down the side that it's satisfying. I don't know. <laughs> well, I have to say my favorite, my favorite one are teeth because they get really, really clean. But yes. right after the teeth are also the bones that have some hollows and where you can actually get somewhere and you see that you've made a difference um, afterwards. Yeah, good. Finished my dry clean. Perfect, job well done. So yeah. now we use the toothbrush as water. And as I said, we want to be careful not to get the bone too wet. So we do not, I repeat, not dunk the bone into the water. Instead, we dunk the toothbrush and then we give the bone a nice brush. We wet the toothbrush again so it gets clean and then get back to the bone. And you can already see how the colour changes, um, how basically she's just brushing away the soil. Now, as Indy's already said, the soil sometimes stains the bone. So it might have some funny colours and you might be like, is it really clean? It might almost look black. So what you then can do is wet your finger and go over the bone. And if your finger comes away clean, <laughs> if your finger comes away clean then Which you're good to it, go it won't um, do if i rub it on the bit i've not cleaned exactly yeah so that's usually keep in mind the finger trick just wet your finger go over the bone and see if it's um if it's clean so yeah i would say show us one piece of bone that you've already cleaned just so we can see how it should look like in the end yeah so you can see that um should we do your favourite example, teeth? Yes, please. So this is um, one tooth um, set into a mandible. Um, most of the mandible is broken off, um, but we can still see where this tooth is sat inside. It's also a really nice example of spongy bone there, actually. On oh, the other yes. Piece. There. Yeah. So oh, that's quite good. And also, this is really good if you find something in your trench and you're not sure if it's bone or stone because it's very muddy or very dirty or whatever, but then look out for this honeycomb structure uh, because if you find that, it's usually a bone. So that's quite a good indicator. Yeah. And this one's quite good because we can see um, the wear on the top of the teeth. So we can see that um, in the colour on the top which obviously it needs to be clean to be able to see differences in colour which is why um, it's very important that teeth are clean but it's the same for all bone because there's all those little details that we're not going to see unless we clean them such as and can I show the cut marks now <laughs> can I show the cut marks <laughs> show the cut marks I found some really good ones whilst I was cleaning this these were the first ones I found which you can see 
there's um, three across them, like that. And then I have this one, which has got, you can see where they've gone um, like this across, probably where they're taking the meat off the bone. They've had to cut it off, which... Um, like little chips off the bone. Yeah. Yeah. So I quite like that one. And then today I found these ones, which I originally thought, oh my God, that's great. And then I turned it over. Wow. That is quite unmistakable. <laughs> <laughs> so someone's had a tasty rib dinner. <laughs> so this is really, this is actually, as you can see from in this excitement, <laughs> this is one of the pleasures of uh, cleaning animal bone that you actually find these things. Because if you're just digging, you find bone, okay, you put it in the fine tray, but it's in the fines room where you then actually find these things that can then help you identify um, the bone, tell you more about the people, how, again, they used the animals, what they did with them. So we've seen we're not just cleaning things for the fun of it, we're actually doing it so we can see more details in the bone. Um, can you tell us what your next steps are? I mean, I don't mean you're not just cleaning them, putting them in a box and then never think about them again, I would hope. <laughs> no, and of course we would never do that. So we can start to see, so the cut marks is one example of details we start to see after we've been cleaned. But the other things that are important is that we can get a true estimate of the amount um, in terms of quantity and also weight of bone that we've got. So I will count every um, bone from a context and I will also weigh it. So we've got an idea of how much we've got from every context. So that will give you an idea of maybe um, very crudely how much animal bone waste are being deposited in certain places over certain time periods. So we can start to look at time periods as well when we marry this information with um, information that we might get from David in terms of dating, um, so which is why it's important that we've got all these forms of information. Um, but we'll also start to be able to do more interesting things um, in terms of identifying them, um, which becomes easier and easier the cleaner and the further down the process we get. So it might be um, identifying which part of the animal we've got. Um, it might be identifying which animals we've got. Um, and both of them are going to be very important in establishing what we've got going on on site. So we're interested in um, what were the animals for. And we can tell that through which parts of the animals we've got left. So um, like we've got meaty bits of bones from Whittenham. Um, so these, as um, a preliminary look over from not a specialist, I would say that quite a lot of the bone we're coming at are from um, a mixture of kind of large domestic animals, they're nicer cuts of meat, um, but we've also got um, animals like horses, I've seen quite a lot of horse teeth and um, I've got horse mandible, that's the top one. So we've also got, you know, animals that are being reared for traction as well. Um, so there's a wide variety of purposes going on and we're starting to see that both by the species, because um, we know that horses um, in this period, that's more what they're being used for. But we're also seeing it through which bones we've got present. And you only start to see that once they're clean. And they get sent to a specialist who really does know what they're on about. And they send us a report back that gives you exactly which species they are, exactly what quantity of each species they are, and exactly which part of it you've got. And the other cool thing that they can do, which I have got an example for, is they can work out something called the MNI, which is the minimum number of individuals. So that's a better estimate for the amount of animals they've got, because obviously cows are a lot bigger <laughs> than quite a lot of other farmyard animals. And therefore, the bones are going to weigh more, they're going to break up into more pieces. So they're going to look statistically huge if you were just to use those as measurements. Whereas what uh, specialists can do is they can work out actually how many individuals the bones are representing. So one of the slightly simpler things that we can do in the finds room where we obviously don't have this specialist knowledge of animal bone specialists, but and we also don't have that much time, but we can already get a good idea um, of what we're dealing with after we've cleaned them. Um, so we can have a look at the different parts. And I think that that's a good time for us to let you at home have a go at identifying um, some of the bits that we have. So there are a few things that we have to keep in mind. And we start first by thinking about what body part it is that we're dealing with. So for example, is it the skull? Is it the vertebra? Is it ribs? Is it long bones? So the arms or legs? Um, or is it the pelvis? 
and then you can start thinking about size. So obviously different size of animals have different sizes of bone and um, you can usually group them into three groups. So into large mammals, into medium sized mammals and into small mammals. And then obviously you also have um, birds and fish, but there the bone already looks very different. So you can quite easily differentiate those. Um, Yes, so I would say let's have a look at one bone. Yeah. Um, and you at home can have a guess at first what type of the body we're dealing with. So we're having this. If you listen closely, you might have an idea. So these are two, two of the same type, uh, type of bone. Which part of the body do you think it is? And then, what do you think, which animal could they have belonged to? So, which one did the left one belong to? Which one did the right one belong to? Good, so I hope you've got the right that this is actually a rib, or rather two ribs. One would be from a very large mammal, so probably something like a horse or a cow, whereas the smaller one is probably from a small mammal. It could be maybe a small cat, it could also be rodent. So that then again is something that we will let the specialists do. But it already again gives us a better idea of what we're dealing with if we only have large mammals or if we also have smaller ones. Um, and then maybe a second one. Oh, I've got a good one. Sorry it's dirty, but you can start to get an idea. Right, so what do you think? Which part of the body is it? Is it part of a lung bone? Is it part of the pelvis? Is it part of the skull? Is it a rib again? Who knows? And then you can think about the size of it. So which size animals do you think it belongs to? So it's almost in these size. <laughs> um, and in this case now, you can also have a closer, right, there we have a second example. And if you compare these two, you'll see a difference. And I can tell you, I hope that by now you figured out that these are um, jaw bones, so teeth in the jaw. Um, and one of them is actually from a carnivore and the other one is from a sheep or a so probably the lower one belonged to a dog. Yeah. So I hope you figure that out. Um, as I say, this is actually the fun thing about uh, working with finds, actually uh, cleaning and discovering little details and then actually being able to put them into categories and figuring out what we're dealing with. So these things are things that we can also observe with reference books in the finds room. So we can we can see how far the teeth are ground down. We can see what part of the body we have. Um, but archaeologists can also use then science to deepen our understanding of what we found. So as we learned last week, pottery can actually help us date events on our site. But what if we can't find pottery or other data artifacts? So some of you might have already jumped to the conclusion and are screaming radiocarbon dating at the screen, but <laughs> um, we can use this to date, for example, wood. And that is all very well when we have the right soil because um, wood survives very well in acidic soil. But if we have alkaline soil, wood usually degrades very quickly and we don't find it. But what does survive in alkaline soil you might have guessed it, animal bone. So um, animal bone is very well preserved and then using the C14 method, so radiocarbon dating on a bone from a sealed context can actually provide us with vital information and help us date um, a structure, a certain context and then give us a bigger picture of the site as, as such. So that's quite good and that's where the science comes in as well. Yeah, and especially now when we're looking at um, radiocarbon dating is obviously the famous one but there are also lots of isotopes that we can use in archaeology to help us understand other aspects of uh, past societies. So um, other good examples include strontium and oxygen, which tell us about the regions the animals were grazing in. So oxygen ends up in our, um, we ended up getting it through water, obviously H2O, it's the oxygen in that. And the idea is that the um, heavier oxygen isotopes fall nearer to the equator 
um, and you get the lighter oxygen isotopes falling nearer to the poles. So the further north you are, the more of the lighter oxygen isotopes you're going to get, opposed to the nearer the equator, the more heavier. So that gives you an idea of how far north or south. Um, strontium, however, that's um, an isotope that's found in different minerals, um, so that can depend during on region. Obviously, isotopes don't respect modern political borders or boundaries so we can't say whether they're from various countries but we can have an idea of geographical regions um, so what we start to do is we can also therefore divvy up the UK into different um, geographical regions so we know that um, for example Dorrington Walls um, which is near Stonehenge is on Chalkland therefore has a very distinctive strontium signature and we can um, have a look at a study that was done by Sarah Vine and others in 2010, where they looked at 13 mandibles of cattle found at Durrington Walls, and what they found was only two of them were actually had signatures that were they were confident were from a local um, source, and that the other 11 seemed significantly different and were most probably from various different regions of the UK. So what um, they infer has happened is that people have moved to um, Durrington Walls with animals to feast, and then. The people are moving from large areas across the UK and bringing those animals with them. So whilst we wouldn't be able to see um, those signatures in the human remains, obviously because they're moving about and they're getting all sorts of different signatures from all over the place and it's quite hard to track all the different things that diets can affect with humans, but with these animal bones we can definitely see that they are in fact grazing in one place and being eaten in another. So we can see that therefore the people are doing this, which is quite exciting I think it's it's just amazing it's isn't it amazing it's just this whole world that's opening up under our feet through archaeology through science but also through cleaning so that's the first bit that needs always cleaning <laughs> always cleaning. never forget that um yeah so i think that's all that we can cover for today so um last but not least i think indy has one more fun fact about animals that she wants to share with us. Yes, I have a fun fact about domestication. <laughs> so we talk a lot about the domesticated animals, such as dogs, um, cattle, pigs, that were all domesticated quite early. So um, other than dogs, the majority of the anim farmyard animals that we think of were domesticated during the Neolithic Revolution. Um, but did you know that we're still domesticating animals today? Um, did you know the rabbit was domesticated during the medieval period and the lab rat was domesticated in the 19th century in the UK? <laughs> I seriously didn't. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for sharing your facts with us. Thank you for um taking us with you on this tour of the animal bone from Earth Trust. And um yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for sticking with us until now. I hope you learned a lot about how we clean animal bone and what we can learn from it about our history. And I also hope that this video sparked a little bit of interest in you to do some of your own research. So if you want to have a close up look at some of the more special animal bones that we found on site, you can have a look at our sketch fab. So we have a couple of 3D models where you can zoom in and you can rotate them around and have a really close up look at the bone itself. And then if you want to be a bit more adventurous, you can look for your own bone when you go on your daily walk, for example, or take a more investigative approach, maybe during your Sunday chicken roast. Um, either way, please make sure that you wash your hands afterwards and you're careful. And then feel free to post your results, maybe some photos, some questions into the comments below. And you can also do some research online. So there are a lot of photos and, and identification guides online that can help you figure out um, what type of bone you have from which animal, um, unless it was part of your dinner, of course, and you already know. But uh, yeah, just enjoy, have fun, learn, and hope to see you next time. Bye.